thanks very much. Um, welcome to today's meeting of the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. And as this is the first meeting of the new year, I'm not certain when you're supposed to stop saying Happy New Year. I'm sure there's a point somewhere. somewhere. Um, but can I take the opportunity to wish everybody all the very best for the forthcoming year? Um, you probably can't have failed to have noticed that it is the year of the environment. Um, there is uh, a fantastic display outside and, and some stalls and um, hopefully people will get a chance after this to, to have a, a brief walk around and we will be doing the formal launch later but more on the environment because it's one of the issues that we'll be discussing. Um, can I just take the opportunity on behalf of, of Gray Morgan and I'm sure all the leaders and everybody else to wish um, John Flarty um, continued uh, recovery from his illness and if you can pass that on on our behalf, great news, okay? Um, can we, as always, ensure that all phones are on silent and that when presenters are presenting, the speakers close to the microphones as they possibly can. Item one then is the apologies for, answer, uh, for absence. And Trudy, uh, do we have any received apologies? We've received apologies from Mayor Anderson, Councillor Paul Hill, Jane Kennedy, Councillor Sporrell, Councillor Sinnott and Councillor O'Neill. Anything to add to that extensive list? No. Item two is declarations for members. Three is the minutes of the previous meeting of the Combined Authority on the 14th of December 2018. They're on pages one to eight. <coughs> Are there any matters arising? If not, can I ask for members to agree those minutes, please? Item four is uh, an update on where, what's happened, I suppose, since uh, we last met, which um, was last year, but only a few weeks in real duration. And people will have seen and, and heard the news report yesterday over Jaguar Land Rover. And like everybody, um, I was extremely concerned, and myself, and the leader of Nosley Council where Jaguar Land Rover is situated in Halewood. We visited the site and um, were able to speak to the senior management team and get some assurances in regard to its long-term future. And, uh, it has to be said that Jaguar Land, Land Rover is one of the biggest employers in the city region and um, does produce some of the highest quality and highest skilled and and best skill, as we said, uh, jobs um, throughout the six districts. So um, <coughs> the, there are fundamental strengths we're told, in the Halewood plant, and there's been significant investment over the last few years. I think it said about half a billion pounds in the game. So um, it's not about the Halewood site, and I, I, you know, I hope everybody is really cognizing that this is not about Halewood, this is about Jag Jaguar Land Rover. About World trading conditions about stuff like um, diesel gate, uh, about the US Sinai um, issues that are ongoing, um, about Brexit has to be said, um, and the uncertainty that's created, and certainly the very real prospect of a no deal Brexit is causing concerns not just to Jaguar but to lots of other areas. But we believe that. We have offered on behalf of the Combined Authority and Nosley Council working on behalf of the Combined Authority, we've offered every assistance to Jaguar Land Rover and we're absolutely certain that the long-term uh, sustainability of the Halewood plant um, is not under question. So um, it's really um, good news that it's not about the plant itself. Um, I believe, I think like all the leaders, that one job is one job. Um, lost, that's too many, but um, we think that um, we will be able to offer alternatives and trading opportunities for anybody who is made voluntary redundant and who wants assistance, so um, I think we'll leave that one there. Just while I'm on the fact that um, this has happened, what Jaguar have done is to um, pull together a task force of which um, Councillor Morgan will be a part of that on Monday and I've also been invited um, to Coventry as part of that, unfortunately only in London, but we will have representation from Kirsty Pierce and, and uh, Councillor Morgan. But there's also another issue which is needed a task force to be pulled together 
and myself and Councillor Phil Davis are part of a task force that's headed up by Mayor Joe Anderson and that's in regard to looking at all the options for the potential um, solutions to the situation that Camel Laird's unfortunately found themselves in. And we're working with the local authorities, with um, government, with Camel Laird, with the unions, um, everybody, all the stakeholders, everybody's really come together and hopefully um, we will be able to do something because the real danger is not just losing a fantastic facility and a brilliant workforce, but it's some of the plans that we've got include Camel Laird in the future, certainly on the mod modularisation agenda and so many other things. So um, I'd just like to put on record, of course, my thanks to everybody on behalf of myself, Phil and, and Joe, who's really pulled out all the stops and we hope that the government will continue to work with us in the spirit of the fashion they have done so far. Um, we just need some further flexibilities and we can get that over the line. People will be aware that in 2018 it was a year of chaos on um, Northern Rail. Um, real misery for many passengers, made only worse by this year the implementation of a 3.2% increase in fares, um, a worse than service, costing them more. So last week, uh, myself and um, Councillor Liam Robinson met with the Chief Executive of both Northern and Network Rail with a delegation of local MPs to set out in no uncertain terms their promise of incremental change, and that means incremental um, increase in the current position in regard to performance. And we believe that the current situation is absolutely unacceptable and made it beyond doubt clear to the senior management uh, team that we think if things don't improve that they need to come to a situation, a stage whereby we don't just threaten to take away franchises but we actually implement that threat and on behalf of the TFN I've made that very clear, Transport for the North is the, one of the board members representing CA and Liam on behalf of Rail North has also made that abundantly clear and um, we hope to see um, significant improvements in performance over the forthcoming um, quarter. In more positive news, <coughs> um, I was delighted along with um, Louise Elman to visit the new Royal and I don't know if anyone, anyone saw the programme last night, it was a programme on BBC TV about uh, hospitals and significantly about the conditions that we find the current Royal in and you can understand the frustrations, can't you, that those staff who are having to work in those conditions when you look just a few hundred yards away and there's a nice shiny hospital. I think through the efforts uh, of the Mayor of Liverpool, um, of politicians across the political spectrum, of campaigners, of ordinary people, we've been able to persuade the government of the need to look at the alternative funding model of other than PFI. That work has started, we visited and had a look around the progress that's being made just think uh, it would be a wonderful facility and we didn't get this new or the offer of a new hospital because the government thought oh go on you can have one we need it because we need to improve the health and well-being of the 1.6 million people in the Liverpool city region a lot of whom use the Royal Hospital and um, it's taken the government a long time I think to come to the realisation that they need to do something but you can see real progress and again like to put on record our thanks um, for that and specifically thanks to the staff who have to put up with the current conditions uh, and yet who are doing a fantastic job on behalf of us all. So um, I'm sure they will be recorded. Item five um, is um, Council May is going to take us through the presentation which highlights some of the key activity within his portfolio which is if you don't tell any education, employment, apprenticeships and skills, very snappy. Um, but Councillor May, you've got some slides and you'll do that and then we can ask some questions. And the mic works. Thanks Chair. So, so we've got, um, we, we've got a programme and we've got <coughs> an ambition about skills and about learning and, and about how people access work and how we encourage people and support people into work and, and thus help grow our economy with local businesses. And the purpose today is just give you a, a quick update of where we're up to. 
So if we move on on the side, <coughs> on, the, on the next one, what we've got on here, on, on our left, that's from our skill strategy, which we agreed last year, which is a five-year programme, and that's some points from that. And I can have these slides sent out to people if they haven't got them. Um, on, our, on the right, we've got part of it was the devolution agreement that we had in 2015 with government. That's two of the main main points that we agreed with government, and they're the main points we're working towards. We're guided by those, and, and the three main elements are set out there. If we move on, so we've got. <coughs> An action plan, as you'd expect. That's there in, in bullet points, and we'll, we'll talk about more individual stuff on those bullet points as, as we move on. So that's where we're going, that's where we're hoping to go, that's our way forward as we see it at the moment. So if we move on to the next one, you notice here I'm, I'm going through this as quickly as I can. Move on to the next one. An apprenticeships chair. Apprenticeships is, is an, an important issue for us within the region. It was an important issue for us when we were discussing and negotiating with government at the time <coughs> of the evolution. And, and the importance of people learning the skills that they need to fit into the, the modern workplace, to, to enable people to access employment with the skills that they need to access that particular employment. And, and it's, it's one of our main, main ways forward, so to speak. The, the, the sad thing in this is, if you look at that top, top line there, 2017-18 figures are a third less starts than they were in the previous year. And that's really disappointing and, and, and something we need to look at, something we need to engage further with employers and see if we can help undo any log jams that they have in enabling them to take on apprentices because without employers making those vacancies available you know we can train people all we need or we want and all we need to but there's, if there's no apprenticeship places for them it, it, it becomes a pointless exercise back to things in, in, in uh, and the way people were treated in the, in the Thatcher year with meaningless, meaningless training schemes, which is not what we're about and not what apprenticeship, the modern apprenticeship is about here. So there's some issues there. It's still and will remain a big part of our agenda because it's, it's a really, a, it's just an important issue, isn't it? It's something that we have to do. So we look into that in, in, and try and understand what that means. And that's the really disappointing thing this year and the fact that our start, starts and apprenticeships are down nationally but ours are less than lower than elsewhere in the country. It's a couple of regions similar to this, <coughs> but in the main as you can see there was some 10% behind the national trend. So we'll do our damnedest to make sure that that is improved. If we move on to our next slide. eventually. Sure. So what well, our actions underway we got we've agreed part-time co-location for engagement capacity as it as it says there. We're gonna launch our apprenticeship port application portal in March which will help us access help people access apprenticeships and, and how they engage within that within that. Um, and as I just said on the previous slide, you know, we need to maintain discussions about and, and reviewing where we are with apprenticeships and why we are where we are and how we can improve and continue to improve and continue for people to gain meaningful qualifications. The interesting thing, Chair, is, is on, those, on those figures, um, it's the age 25 plus that has dropped the most significantly. Uh, and level two accreditation is, is one that's down. 
but there is a bit of an increase in level four, which is which is the much higher one. So that's that's a good point. But we need to make sure that we address where we are on level twos and on twenty five plus accessing apprenticeships and, and gaining and the qualifications that they need. So we we we'll, we'll launch that portal as it says in March, and we'll have our graduation celebrations to coincide with that. We move on to the next one, and, and we go on to the adult education budget. Well, we think it's 52 million. It's, 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 been, it, it, it's wavered around that, um, but we, we will take control of that adult education budget as a combined authority in August, which is probably about two years later than we thought we were going to take control of that. And, and the idea of us um, accessing from government the adult education part of the education and training budget, we wanted to have um, much more than, than just that, is that we can tailor things to, to support our economy, to support our business needs, to, to be able to enable people to take that leap in the dark. It's been said before here that, you know, my grandchildren, the jobs that they will probably do don't even exist as, as, as we sit here today. So we need to uh, enable people to be able to have confidence in, in what they what they do and how they provide and how they understand what's coming down that, that road and how they make sure that they've got the the courses, the training, the the, the information available for people to make choices and we can talk talk about choices as, as we go on. So it, it, it's it's about being more responsive. It's about um, understanding what's happening within our city region and tailoring stuff towards that, rather than rather than just the national stuff that's happened in the, in the past and continues to happen with the other seventy five percent of this funding that is outside of our control. Because the, the fifty two million pounds we see there is some twenty five percent of that particular funded stream for that particular adult education. So, where are we up to? I think our slides tell us there. We've, we've, we've been through the area-based review. We've come to some conclusions from that. we talked to people. We've, we are now, in, as of yesterday, I think, opening up the second phase of, of tenders for people to say, this is what we can provide and this is what we what we want to provide and how we can cost it, etc. And, and we'll start delivering that. This is a juggernaut um, chair that isn't going to deliver a, a brave new world come the 2nd of August because it will need uh, some time to turn around, I think, and some time to work within within the system, some time to work with, with our um, colleges and providers and local authorities also, who are also providers. Um, as we go forward over the coming years. So it's an interesting and exciting prospect that we, we have that flexibility um, to tailor things into our own, to our own city region chair. So if we move on to the next one, which is households into work. What we what we found with household in, into work is that, as it says there, we found that there's more people with 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 multiple and co complex barriers stopping them getting into work than we thought. That there were, you know, as, as we've sort of looked into this and, and started to give the support, we we began to realise that actually the support that's needed and the help that is needed to, to, to families, it's greater than we initially thought. And, and we're, we're giving um, support to households, and that's really important that we do that. But, you know, we have to also understand that there's some 250,000 inactive people in the city region. So within households into work and other similar things, we need to be able to scale that up 
so we can reach out to those people that are in are inactive and help them um, gain that that confidence that they need and support that they need to enable them to get into gainful employment and and, and, and move forward. So, so so that's an important one for us, and, and there's some points there on the slide that tells us how we we will try to work towards that. But if we move on again, Chair, to to nine and skill, skills for growth. We've, we, we have invested some significant time into getting skills for growth action plans right. And the, 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 they have actions for employers, for, for, for providers, for councils and, and for the CA. So as that goes forward, I mean, as these actions go forward, the Employment and Skills Board um, which is a joint CA LEP um, group will be reviewing that, monitoring it as we go forward, etc. And again, the theme isn't it? The theme is you know, there's careers leaflets, there's careers information to communicate jobs about what, what's going on. So that's the skills for growth chair. If we move on again. We have not many more, I don't think, now, so we can all do the slide aside of relief. If we move out on again, that's completely different than the one I've got the one <laughs> Now it's just changed again, so that that's that's um, a completely unreadable um, <laughs> slide. That's a completely unreadable slide, but you have to say when you get a hard copy, it's still unreadable. <laughs> but that that's a, a follow-on to the previous slide here, which is which is I would say the same things. When we move on to careers, it's a it's pretty fragmented the career stuff. It, it's there's lots of providers involved, but. but there's still a lot to do with, with schools. There's still a lot to do with the culture and attitude within schools chair towards careers and career progression. And it was one of our major disappointments when we when we did do the devolution agreement that um, government and, and mostly I I sure Phil will agree, mostly it was the civil servants that blocked us on on have an influence because what we wanted to was to have an influence on the 14 plus school cohorts to make sure that they are ready for life and, and you know it, it's not just about the basic school skills that everybody needs it, it's about how do, what do you think how do you see your life progressing because at 14 15 16 they're not questions that you, you think about as, as normal. You think about the, you know, whatever the latest game, I don't know what the latest game is at the moment, but, but that's, that's the world that our young people live in. So we need to be able to encourage and, and help them understand what's going forward and how they, how they access employment, how they think about where their career and where their life is, is, is going to take them. But well, even alongside that, how they deal, we, we've seen, haven't we, with one well, of the major problems of this government's universal credit on, on how people learn to understand that many jobs these days are paid monthly, and some of them met monthly in arrears, and how, how do you manage those type of budgets? Because it's not, when we, when we talk about careers, that type of thing is equally important, it fits together, and we wanted to be able to influence that. We haven't been able to. And there's been uh, initiatives in the past which I've been involved with, which have attempted uh, at, a, at a light scale to involve schools in, 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 in careers information and, and careers advice and, and understanding. And they had limited success as, as well. So we need to engage further with, with schools. We need to engage with the Regional Schools Commissioner and get support from the Regional Schools Commissioner that, how important this is because if governments led by their civil servants um, aren't prepared to let us have that, that capacity to deliver 
that kind of thing to our school children at 14 as a city region. We need to make sure that whatever wheels we can turn, whatever locks we can unlock, to encourage and, and if possible insist that our senior schools are giving that advice and education and support and integrating and talking to businesses and bringing people in to explain what goes on. That, that's really important. I've waffled on this one too because I consider this one to be particularly important. So, so I, I think I've probably said enough on that one, Chair, and if we move on again. Employment. Well, touched on some of that as we've gone forward um, through the presentation. And, and what, what we what we know don't, what we know is, is if you look at that top bullet point there with overall employment figures mask that inactivity that I mentioned earlier on. And, and how how true is that? You know, it's it, it's it's something we need to move on. It's something we need to do. It's something. We need, to, we need to keep focusing on that narrow unemployment and unemployment gaps. And 25%, 250,000 people are inactive. We need to be able to scale up our programs and support people. Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, Chair. Well, there's another, sorry, there is another one, which is how we go forward, etc. Now, we need to have discussions with government over the impact on the, on the third less take ups this year than last year on, on apprenticeships. We need to talk, continue to talk, and I know you do, um, Steve, but we need to continue to talk to, to, to government about the apprenticeship levy and the effect that's having, which feedback we're getting, and what the conversation we see just, just earlier. The, the feedback we're getting from employers is actually, this seems to be a hindrance rather than a help for, for apprenticeships. And you know, that may may be masking or or be in, being influential on that drop that we've mentioned. So we need to continue to do that. We need to see how where we are where we can scale up our programmes to give that support and help to people. And we need to engage further or, or open doors further for employers. And, and that's that's probably with with, with this whole employment um, right through apprenticeship skills etc. The most important thing because we've we, you know we've done the survey that we did. I think it's has ever been done recently about employers and what they what they want or don't want. But we need to scale up and we need to understand as well. And we need employers to talk to us about why they are taking up less apprentices. Than, than we have in the past and why it isn't increasing, which is which is the theme for the day, I, I suppose. And I don't mean to be negative, but we, we can't hide from these things. So employers need to tell us what barriers there are that we might be able to help with opening that door again and making sure that we, we move forward on a positive basis and, and get that get those figures up. I'll stop there. Fantastic. Um, I think grasping at Fortnite, that's the um, the big oh, online the video game, yeah. just in case you want to get down with the kids. Um, <coughs> Deputy Portfolio Holder first, I think uh, Councillor Robertson Collins wants to come in. Thank you Chair, thanks very much to uh, Councillor Mayor for that report and there is a lot of positive work going on sort of indicating that the benefits of devolution which is really really encouraging to hear. But just to come back to the point that um, my colleague did mentioned several times there around the really, really concerning drop in apprenticeship starts. Um, um, Councillor Mayor was quite polite on some of that. I mean, I'm wondering how much of this is, is uh, in terms of breakdown of, of the employers, public sector, private sector, and how much could be maybe laid at the feet of government for lack of uh, investment in public services and how much that is having a massive impact on, on recruitment in the area and that's having that knock-on effect on apprenticeships. And also just to explore maybe some of the um, issues that he also drew attention to around careers advice and guidance, and particularly in schools, and how much schools are still pushing that apprenticeship as a, as a you know a viable option um, rather than the kind of HE FE push that they, they traditionally focus on. Um, I do remember a while ago discussing the work that we were going to do with school governors and just saying you know how how has that gone on if there's anything we can do in that region. Thanks. 
can only agree with most, with most, most, most of them. The, the, the school curriculum, as it is, is beyond our influence. They, these are government requirements, these are schools gear themselves up for the attainment levels that are set out for them, don't they? And until we get a change, I'll say a change in government, until we get a change in government and we start to understand or, or we start to be able to influence and, and say to schools, yes, the academic route is important. You know, and it is important when, you know, we also need to think about the vast majority of people who will, will, will end up going through their lives and their working lives and their careers, etc. without university degrees, without all of those really important um, qualifications. And make sure that the whole influence there is, is equal so that you're not an inferior person if you go down a certain road because that's the right road for you and it is the right road and the skills are there, the, the, the support should be there, the advice should be given by schools, the, the, the workplace experience that, that our young people get in, in schools needs to be treated and, 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 and sorted out properly because the system that we have at the moment isn't really, you know, well I don't think, it, 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 there'll be some businesses that do a fantastic job and I'm absolutely certain that's the case on engaging with those young school people but you know it's no use going into something and, and being, you know, making the tea for the week and doing a bit of photocopying, but that's not really helpful so that side of it needs to be grown and grown quite heavily as, as we progress with a change of government because we won't get it with this lot. Every, we haven't got the civil service anyway because every one of them is now working on Brexit. So, so it's really important stuff and we need to do what we can within our city region, working with all the partners that we have whilst we wait for a change of government where we can get things done properly. I think Dame Jan Beer would appreciate the fact that we do um, um, understand that academia is an important element of this, but obviously that's within here and the others charge. Ours is around FE and uh, apprenticeship and skills provision, so that's why we're, we're concentrating so much on that. Um, Councillor Davis? Yeah, thanks, um, Steve. Uh, I wonder if just sticking on the apprenticeships issue, I wonder if Ian would, would agree with me, and I, I think just to emphasise this, you know, the apprenticeship um, levy is, the way it's being operated is an unmitigated disaster, and I think we need to say that, and that's squarely at the fault of the government's door. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the ideal uh, scenario that we, we, we've all agreed for many years is is to, I think you said it again, is to have parity of esteem between academic and vocational. But the way the apprenticeship levy is being up is, is not being operated properly um, is is uh, is a major factor in us not being able to achieve that, that ideal. And one example, Steve, which I know you you unearthed um, you can't use apprenticeship levy for um, salaries. Um, yes, it's actually in. It was in the the, to the last Tory manifesto. And in spite of the fact that I know you've pointed that out to ministers, they're still seemingly um, refusing to relax the, the way the levy operates, which is a major barrier um, for us to deliver on the skills agenda that, that Ian has just sort of articulated. Um, so it seems to me that until, and you know, we know, we know from employers that a lot of employers have just given up with the, the, the levy because it's so complicated. So it seems to me that until government really get a grip of, of the uh, apprenticeship agenda and the, and the levy and the way the levy is so restrictive, when it's going to be very difficult for um, Areas like ours to make to make a difference. Now we have done things. So the free travel for apprenticeships is a fantastic scheme. And that's great. But 
for, for me, it's about us as a, as a combined authority saying, you know, we're, we're not the ones blocking this, it's, it's government. And we need to keep on putting the pressure on governments to, um, to really deal with the apprenticeship levy. I'm, I understand it's, it's billions underspent. Um, and my, my concern, and I know we've asked for freedoms and flexibilities to use some of that money locally, but the danger is that if, if, if they don't get a grip of it, that money will just go back to the Treasury and won't be used for the purposes for which it was intended. So I really do feel that there are some big, big issues here, but again, it, it really comes back to the government really sorting this out. Steve? Thank you, Chair. Just, just to reiterate what uh, Councillor Davis said, I, I still think the greater respect, of, even with a change of government, I, I don't want to, I, I think we need to be addressed with this situation and issue at the present moment in time. And, you know, with, with some of the work that's going on behind the back of the scenes with, with the apprenticeship levy that I know yourself looking at chair, I think we should still be lobbying and knocking on government still to try and get more devolution on this. I don't think I think this is going to be one of the key areas of actually it's devolution and having a look at the apprenticeship levy. I think we've got a massive underspending in our city region, not just in here but in the northwest of it's a collaboration or a collaborative approach with Manchester or some of the other areas or Cheshire to try and have a look at this as a northern thing as well. I do believe by having the devolution on some of the um, levy money will help us to look at other initiatives. It's quite, it's quite rigid on what it actually does at the moment in time. I think we need to have it more loose and be able to look at employees. I think the request from employees is, is that we have to be able to do this. This is just looked upon as a tax from employees. And it's, a, it's creating that negative impact. Whereas employees are actually growing, can't use it because they've used all the levy money already. And they have no other ability to actually go out there and look at the funds to be able to do anything differently. So, so my ask would be, as the combined authority, to, to carry on writing and pursuing through our different areas into government and carry on going on this as one of the key attributes for, for business growth. Because I think until we can get our skills strategy sorted, and that means not levy is just one key element of that bigger picture, until we get that sorted, we're not going to be able to create the economic growth and prosperity we need to do as a city region. That's all on. I entirely echo what Asif just said. If ever there was an argument for um, city region devolution, this is it. Um, clearly, we've got the relationships, we've got the understanding of the needs, we put the work in in terms of skill strategy so that we know what needs to happen, and yet we're being held back by the lack of resources. And also, uh, a, a fragmentation which, let's be honest, goes back 20 years in terms of careers and things like that, that dismantling of careers advice. Um, goes back well before the, the, the last Labour government. Um, what I'm also concerned about is the uh, adult education budget, and we still don't precisely know what the money is that we're dealing with there, uh, according to what Ian said. So uh, uh, that's again something that's several years late, and still we don't know the detail of what we're going to do. So I don't know if we know when we're likely to know the, the outcome of that. I wasn't sure that was in your slides or not. You may well have to figure come through all, all the green boot stuff after after, after budget. But it, it's it's in that vicinity. It's not it's not going to be any fantastic gigantic difference within the AEB around that 52 million. So 52 million pounds is a good base for us to to and we constantly do. And that's, that's the way forward because that's where it's going to be over there. You know, if it does if it's not going to hit the ball, it just looks like it the ball. Um, Lynn? I just wanted to flag up an issue about uh, tackling disadvantage and inequality within the apprentice levy system as well. It seems quite perverse that at the moment I could get £18,000 to do an MBA out of the apprenticeship levy, but City of Liverpool College down the road are turning away construction uh, apprentices because they've run out of funding for those apprenticeships and what we're going to see is an increase in the inequality of access to training in our communities where those people who need it the most to get them on in life are not able to access it but we're finding creative ways to use the apprenticeship for level five six and seven training uh, which um, employers are using when really that wasn't ever what it was meant to do in the first place um, so I just 
wrap this up, or have you got any? Yeah, just a transition <laughs> point to that, because that's a, a, an equally important point. But it's not just about that adult education budget, particularly when we talk about construction chair. It's not just about that ed adult education budget or other, or other government funded, because most companies within the construction industry, when you employ people above a certain number, have to pay a levy to the construction industry training board, which is, I think, the last one standing of that sort of independent training. Now, we will continue to talk to the CITB and have a long history going long before this job of talking to the CITB with another hat on, um, to make sure that they don't just focus their, their, the way they point construction companies when you go for a, an apprentice and, and an apprentice training, that they don't just point them to their their own facility within Cheshire, etc. But facilitate even more within our local areas because there's a whole series of issues there, isn't there? So it's not just we will continue to look at that within the within the AEB, but we need to continue to discuss and try and influence the construction industry training board on how they how they deliver the accreditation because if a college or, or whatever is it's, it's giving that training out. There's only um, two or three accreditations that will be accepted on building sites, and most of it is CICS, which is the Construction Industry Training Board one. So the colleges, you mentioned Liverpool College, they'll be working to those standards. So there's a whole issue there, isn't there? And, and you know, I think it's a wash with money that CITB. So, so we need to continue to talk to them. But more than valid point. You can wrap up, don't you? Thanks, Councillor Mayor. Um, I think that's stimulated a lot of debate, but a lot of thought as well. But it's our role as a combined authority to work with government of whatever persuasion, and we will continue to do that. But it's also our legitimate position to criticise government when they've got it wrong. And on this one, they have got it wrong. We all agree with the principle that there should be contributions from employers towards training. Um, that way, the employers see some value in the training in the individual then we'll get the training that we all think that they should get. The problem is government keep on telling us that we need an evidence base so that we can argue these points. So I guess what we've done in the Liverpool City region, we have an evidence base. That suite of documents that we couldn't see is just part of a whole process that we can say, um, here are the skill shortage areas in the Liverpool City region. These are the sort of occupations that we need this is the capacity that we have within our provider base. What we need is you, government, to provide us with the opportunity to realise all of that. So we've pulled it all together for them. And you're right, I think many people have said there are hundreds of millions, if not billions, still lying in a pot that are allocated for apprenticeships across the country that we are not able to access. And we've got not just one college, we've got a number of our providers who have exhausted their current um, funding uh, agreements and they have capacity to do more and employers are asking them can they do it now this is absolutely obscene as far as I'm concerned so we need to continue to work to see whether we can alleviate some of these issues that we haven't um, caused but that will start to address the skill shortage areas and we keep on saying to government this is not just for the Liverpool City region this is on behalf of UK PLC um, but whatever ever comes out of Brexit, who knows? But we um, are told that there will be restrictions on the number of people coming here. If we don't start doing stuff now, the skill shortage areas will be exacerbated. Those skills that we need for the future will be trained in areas like ours, and people in our 